All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2022 NOFA Massachusetts Winter Conference. Uh, excited to have you with us this morning for our virtual conference. You know, there's some, some ways I wish we were at uh, Worcester State University, which is where we normally have our, our winter conference. Uh, given the temperatures this morning and, you know, the challenges of getting about and going from the parking lot to the the different buildings. Perhaps today, you know, there are some advantages to having a Zoom, Zoom conference. So I hope everyone is staying warm and uh, has a, a hot beverage and, and uh, is ready to have a, a great session this morning. Uh, my name is Paul Bertler. I'm a volunteer with NOFA Massachusetts. And I'm here to be the host with uh, of the Simple Seasons extension for the Market Garden Gardener Workshop with Jen Burt. Before we get started, I have a few uh, announcements that I would like to make. NOFA Massachusetts is strengthening our commitment to racial equity and justice by examining whiteness and dismantling systems of white supremacy that are a part of many dominant systems, including our agriculture and food systems. We also want to honor the indigenous land stewards who are the original occupants of the land that we now reside on. Please take a moment to recognize those who came before you wherever you live. We would like to invite our white participants, allies and co-conspirators to take action in support of BIPOC led organizations. I'd also like to highlight two events during the conference for our Spanish speaking and BIPOC participants. I would like to thank, take a moment to thank our sponsors. Uh, without our sponsors, we would not be able to put this conference on. Um, we have a lot of great companies. You know, this time of year, you may be thinking about things that you need for your farm, homestead or garden. And when you're making your purchases, uh, likely many of these companies have some great things that you could probably use. So please give them some consideration. Don't forget about our annual online auction. Lots of great items there to be had. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do some bidding and um, some good deals to be had. And finally, speaking of good deals, we have our, um, you know, one of the highlights of the in-person conference is the vendors. Uh, we have many of the same vendors in our virtual vendor marketplace, which can be found in your online program book. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Jen Burt. Uh, Jen has been the farm steward at Dismas Farm in Oakham, Massachusetts for nine years. They work, uh, the working nonprofit farm provides a residential uh, safe haven for formerly incarcerated men. They do four season cultivation of two acres of vegetables using organic practices. Jen is passionate about winter growing in order to spread out the workload and the produce beyond the summer season. Uh, Jen also loves observing the resilience of plants. So we're thrilled that you can join us today, Jen, and take it away. Great. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I love this conference. Um, it's always usually nice not to have to travel since I actually live in Worcester. So oftentimes I get to go right over to Worcester State. But I, yeah, I am excited that I don't have to go outside today. <laughs> um, all right. So let me pull up my slideshow. And um, this is, you know, my first time ever presenting in Zoom. And I think it's going to go pretty smoothly, but um, yeah, just bear with me if I have any sort of um, technical things, but I think I'm gonna do all right. All right, so um, who is this workshop for? I, I wanted to kind of talk about who might get something out of this. Um, this is for farmers who don't have access to any heated structures. Um, on my farm, we do have one heated greenhouse um, that's 24 by 48 and a smaller seedling greenhouse. But um, for many years, uh, I didn't, I only had the very small seed, seedling greenhouse. So when I started out, 
Um, I didn't have access to heated space. And so I was really trying to figure out what I could do to extend the season, even if I didn't have that. And so I wanted to share a lot of what I learned as someone who's just kind of using lower tech tools or just seeing what plants can do um, and how tough they are. And I put that in there. People who find joy in discovering the resilience of plants. Um, one of my favorite things is, you know, it drops down below freezing for the first time and going out and finding, oh, these turnips are still alive, you know, and then having a really snowy, windy day in November and thinking, oh no, that's it. You know, these mustard greens are toast and then having a warm spell and they come back. So I, I just love that discovery. Um, but also it's for people who um, like root vegetables. I'm not going to get too into storage or anything like that, but it's definitely um, growing and harvesting fresh produce. We definitely do as much as we can, but having access to um, those root vegetables, squashes, all, all those storage things helps us have kind of a diversity on our farm. Um, and this is also for people like um, Paul said in the introduction, it's nice to be able to spread out the workload a little bit. Um, and it's also for people who want to provide local food for yourself or your family or your community at a time when um, often it's harder to find local food. Um, so some of the specific things we're going to cover in this workshop, um, the importance of knowing what planting zone you're in and uh, your specific microclimate and kind of observing so you learn a little bit more about your specific growing space. Um, the importance of daylight. I think a lot of people think about cold when it comes to growing um, kind of in the late fall, winter, early spring, but daylight I think is the number one thing to think about. And when we get into um, specific planting schedules, I wanna talk a little bit more about that. I'm also gonna talk about how to pick varieties um, and some of the varieties that have worked for me. Uh, we're going to go over row covers and um, some unheated structures. We have two unheated hoop houses and a caterpillar tunnel. And hopefully you can learn from the successes and failures that I've had. Um, and so you can build off that. And I'm also going to provide some resources where I've learned a lot. And also hopefully you can. Um, we're not going to talk about perennials. Um, this is one of my dog's Harley um, here with some chives. Um, so we do grow some perennials on our farm, but for the most part, for a variety of reasons, we don't grow a lot of perennials, but they can be a great way to extend your season. Um, you know, you can rhubarb, asparagus, um, berries, fruit trees, these are they're all going to help you maybe extend your season, but we're not going to talk about them today. Um, and so Paul kind of introduced me a little bit, but um, I wanted to just go over who I, who I am. So I'm the farm steward at Christmas Family Farm. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we're in Ocam, which is on Nipmuc land uh, in Central Mass. And I've been farming for 11 years and at my, where I've been at for nine. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about where you, where we get our, like who our teachers are, right? So I've done a lot of my own um, learning at workshops and books and social media. But um, I also, uh, when I decided I wanted to go into farming, I um, did the Mafka apprenticeship, which I can't uh, highlight enough for anyone that is thinking about going into farming or starting out. Um, and I worked uh, at Morning Dew Farm with Brady Hatch and Brendan McQuillan and learned so much from them. And I also worked on Newlands Farm um, when it was in Sutton and learned so much from the refugee farmers there. And um, I was really lucky in my job that my, the person who had had my position before, Word Holloway, um, has mentored me and still lives down the road, which has been such a gift. Um, and I also just am really lucky to have a network of 
friends who are farmers and kind of teaching each other. And I um, identify as white, I'm queer, I'm working class, and I'm temporarily able-bodied. I say temporary because I think it's important to acknowledge that that isn't always the case. Um, anyone can become disabled at any point. So uh, I think thinking of that as farmers is really important. Um, who is it accessible to? Um, that kind of leads into, you know, I've been an organizer for social and climate justice um, for most, you know, of my life. And that influences the work I do. And um, it's a part of the reason that I do see as an extension is I think it's a great concrete way to um, help fight climate change. Um, we're not importing food from halfway around the world if we can get it in our backyard as much as possible. Um, and I love eating root vegetables and winter squash, which I think is important if you're eating in January or February or April or <laughs> you're eating those old squash. Um, so keep that in there. Um, so Dismas Farm, um, we um, are part of a larger nonprofit that works to um, provide housing and transitional services to men um, coming out of prison and in recovery. Um, and I'm gonna actually, so I'm gonna show a video really quick. Um, so you can find out from, you can kind of see what our farm looks like, but also you can hear from the people that I work kind of in, work with in their own words, what the farm is about, so. Jen, I, we don't hear any audio if there's Oh no, oh no, okay. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, I think I probably have to do share audio, huh? All right, that's what we, hold on. Um, share. Um, all right. Advanced sharing options. Is the, is, is the um, volume on the video? There's a, a- Oh, it could just uh, be, oh no, that's on. That's on. Hmm. All right, let me see. I want to take a couple of seconds to figure out if I can um, share audio. And then if I can't, this video is on YouTube. You can watch it and we can, um, I can just play it and can kind of see some images and I can talk a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, I'm still sharing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Jen, did you hear the audio in your headphones? I could hear it, yeah. Maybe, could you unplug your headphones and try that? Oh yeah, we'll try it and if it doesn't work. All right. There we go. It, it is still pretty quiet, Jen. Okay. It, it's hard to hear. Okay. Um, all right. So um, we'll just let the video play, and then I'll um, I'll just tell you a little bit. Um, yeah. So um, one of the reasons that I wanted to show a video was because um, you know. I like when I can to have, um, I like to have someone 
co-present with me who has been behind the wall and has that experience and let them speak to their own experience um, of being incarcerated. Um, a lot of people are interested in the work that we do and it's very transformative, but I also um, don't want to tell other people's stories. Um, I have a criminal record. I'm one of three, one in three Americans have a criminal record. Um, my criminal record comes from civil disobedience. It, I kind of chose to put myself in that scenario. Um, and I'm not the typical person with a criminal record. It disproportionately affects people of color. Um, and so, you know, for me, I work with all types of people, people that come from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and if anyone is interested in talking kind of more about our work, I'd love to be in touch. Like, um, but uh, it's not going to kind of be the focus of this presentation. These are some of the faces of the people that I have worked with. Um, there's our heated greenhouse. Oh, this guy Cordell, he is like fabulous. Grew up on a farm in Jamaica and uh, hadn't lived on a farm in like 40 years and then came back um, to living on our farm. Um, yeah. So, and this is kind of a picture to show you some of the people I work with. Um, so on the right, um, Chris. David and Cordell are all people who have been incarcerated and live and work on the farm. And then on the left, uh, Sarah and Allison are, um, are, we have a year long live in fellowship of recent college graduates or other young people. Um, and they live in community with people who are coming out of jail. And um, so that's actually, we're hiring for this upcoming season. So if anyone is interested in that, contact me. Um, but one of the big things, I picked this photo because it highlights a couple things. Um, one, um, this is our garlic planting this year. This is like an ideal photo of what I want our fields to uh, look like. Um, we have permanent beds and we had just put down new fresh compost to build the beds back up. Um, we put down some cardboard so we had really clear paths. Um, because I have people coming in who sometimes have never touched a tomato plant before, right? They are afraid of touching a tomato plant. Having raised beds or permanent beds is really helpful because it, it creates a really easy visual cue to someone. This is where I should walk. This is where I shouldn't walk. Because when a weed grows in that path later, it might not be as apparent to someone who doesn't know. And so that's great for visitors or uh, people who are working on the farm. Um, and so a lot of our system, I try to make it simple as possible because we have people of all skill levels that are going to be using it um and yeah so and after we um planted this garlic um we covered this with hay mulch so it wasn't exposed over the winter um and we've been using the permanent no-till beds uh, for about five years mostly for soil health reasons um and one last thing about um, kind of related to the fact that I um, am work, working on a farm that is part of the prison system is there is another workshop today from 4.30 um, until 5.15. And it's with the folks um, at New, um, New Society Gardens and they do really great work. So if you're interested in it um, and interested in people who are doing some really great horticultural work in prison, that's a great workshop. So let's get into the actual nitty gritty of what our farm does. So it's two acres of intensive vegetable production. When I say intensive, I think a big part of that is for season extension purposes, is a lot of beds I'm planting in two or three times um, and trying to turn them over pretty quickly, you know, pulling, planting peas and then um, pulling them out and getting the fall brassica in there as quickly as I can. Um, because that way, you know, it just provides using the space as much as possible. Um, and we're in USDA zone 5B. If you don't know your USDA zone, it's really easy to just put that in and your address in, um, and you can find it. Um, and, but it's really important for season extension because that, um, it's going to 
help you know um, when is your first frost date, when is your last frost date. Um, and that's, you know, it's general. We actually are on like kind of this intersection of three different zones, right, where I live. Um, and so also, you know, doing some observation. And this is where record keeping, I think, is really important in season extension. So you remember like, oh, this died this year, but we had a really early frost. Um, but the next year, it might last longer because, you know, the frost was later. So keeping those records, if you can, and learning your own kind of microclimate is really helpful. Um, and so most of the food that we grow um, goes to, at this point, it goes to we, uh, hunger initiative we have, and we're giving a lot of food to food pantries um, in both the Worcester area. And um, that's been really great. <clears throat> um, we transitioned to that during the pandemic when we stopped doing farmer's markets, um, ended up getting a lot of grants to bring fresh produce to people. Um, but we also do a 40 member summer CSA and a smaller winter CSA. And we have a small farm stand from May through November. And we also do various events where we will sell our produce. Um, all right, so, oops. Yeah. All right, so this photo I just took actually like two weeks ago, I think it was like December 31st. Um, and this is one of my favorite crops to grow. It's Chinese six stem mustard. I'm still convincing people uh, that they it's exciting to eat. Um, it's um, something that people are less familiar with, but that's definitely something I really enjoy growing um, and introducing people to. And it will um, really survive almost anything from what I can tell um, and regrows really quickly. So I think the number one consideration when you're thinking about season extension is sunlight. So this is a good example of a variety. We'll, we'll get into this a little more that actually does regrow a little bit in lower light conditions. But when you're thinking about what you're gonna grow, like you're looking at your seed catalog and you're gonna often see DTM, days to maturity. Um, a lot of times that is, that's based on, you know, you're planting it maybe at more of a traditional time. It's maturing into the summer um, and you're harvesting it until, you know, it gets too cold, right? Um, but this can shift with available daylight. So it's something to really think about. Um, and you'll see this sometimes in seed catalogs, they might say, um, you know, add a fall factor of 14 days. So you're thinking it's going to take, um, because it's something is maturing into the fall where the daylight is decreasing, um, you're going to want to give it a, a plan a little more time for that. And so that's something that you can learn a little bit about every different crop that you're growing. But there's a lot of resources too where people have really looked into this. and. Um, Another big thing to consider when it comes to sunlight is um, what's called the Persephone period. Um, Elliot Coleman um, came up with this name after the Greek goddess. Um, and it's when there's less than 10 hours of daylight. And basically during that time, things are just, they're not really gonna grow for you um, or they're gonna grow so slowly that it's pretty imperceptible. Um, so when you're thinking about, oh, I want to be harvesting in January, you can be harvesting right now, but what you're going to harvest, it really has to be kind of ready for your, the, the size you want it to be to harvest before you get into that period. So for me, um, the period of less than 10 hours of daylight is November 7th to February 1st. So anyone in this area, that's going to be pretty similar for you. Um, and that's another thing you can just Google like daylight calendar and you can put in any date. It's great. And you can just be like, oh, what's the sunrise time? What's the sunset? What, how much more, how many more minutes of sunlight am I getting tomorrow than I'm getting today during like this deep winter time, right? Um, and so when we're thinking um, 
the other thing that this um when you're thinking of daylight that's talking a lot about when you're getting into the winter right but also in the spring the returning daylight is going to trigger the a lot of annual plants to think that really put energy into growing seeds so for us the time that i'm doing the kind of least amount of harvesting is in the kind of like basically april is like i got nothing because a lot of the things that i grow I even overwintered starting in march they're just going to start going to, to seed they're going to flower um and you will if you're like me you're going to try to like hold on to them too long but it's probably better for you to just pull them out and get if you're in like a hoop house, get something in early. Um, and it's always tricky, but it, it'll be better if you do it. <laughs> Although if it's outside and you don't need that space, and then it's a really nice, like something for pollinators, or you could, that's also a great time if you want to save seeds. Um, and so I'm going to get into um, right now, right? We're planning for spring. When are we going to plant? How can you? Uh, kind of get a jump start on the season. Um, so this photo was taken in early April of 2020, I think. And there's a few things I want to highlight. Um, when you think of sunlight, um, April 1st has 12 hours and 45 minutes of, of sunlight, which is, um, and then by the end of the month is 14 hours, which August has 13 and 14 hours of sunlight. So we think of, you know, August being super sunny usually in our region, but um, actually April has a lot of sun. It might be cold, but there is sun for plants to be growing. Um, but we also live in New England, or I live in New England, I'm assuming most people at this conference live in New England, um, and it's mud season, right? So your biggest um, obstacle and challenge when you're thinking about starting early like say that we're lucky there's no snow cover in april like early april like there was this in this year that i took this photo um but if it's really money the plants are not gonna do well because it's just they're gonna be waterlogged it's if it's too many it's hard for you to just work in it sometimes this is one of those situations where the fact that we're no till is really helpful because it's a lot easier to do uh, work that's people powered and you know hand tool powered um, than getting a tra tractor into a field where you're just going to compact everything. Um, so this is, a, is also a good example of just trying to think, okay, in the knowing in your fall season maybe what you where you want to plant the earliest stuff in the spring and so knowing maybe where you're drier or wetter this is a drier part of our fields lower down towards the trees very wet so i just don't even try to get in there early um but one of the things you can see in this photo is we had planted um, i think peppers and tomatoes in this area the previous year and we planted them into landscape fabric so I knew I wanted to get in there early. I kind of held on to those crops pretty late. Couldn't plant a cover crop, but um, so I left the landscape fabric on over the winter. So right before this photo was taken, we pulled up the landscape fabric, and it's great. There's like uh, a just beautiful bed to plant into. It uh, you're kind of I do a lot of transplanting, a lot more than I think the average farmer might do because I'm transplanting, I'm gonna beat those spring weeds. And anything I can do to beat weeds in all seasons is great. So here we're planting um, kind of in the back back rows here, those those are trellises. We're gonna we were direct seeding peas. Um, and then um, in the foreground of the photo we're transplanting beets, which is an example of uh, something that most people don't transplant, but um, I kind of do just because it gives us a little bit of a jump. Um, and so some, I've kind of gotten into this, but some general rules for spring planting is uh, thinking about 
transplanting versus direct seeding, especially if you have an option between two, um, there's pros and cons to both. So transplants, you're gonna be putting in a more mature plant, right? So you have some, maybe some time in a greenhouse, um, or if you're starting your plants, you know, in your house with the grow light. Um, but, the, and they generally will survive, but you might suffer some shock and it might create a little bit slower growth because, you know, the, a plant might be able to survive when it's 35, but it would much prefer it to be 60. Um, but the, the opposite of that is, um, the in cold season in cold soils you're going to get slower or less um, direct seeded germination and that's another thing that is really great to look up is you know a lot of seed catalogs will have ideal uh, temperatures for germination so thinking about that so for me for example transplanting those beets is worth it because i'm getting kind of a more mature crop but i have to be careful if they're too big the leaves are just gonna, they're not gonna be happy about being cold. Um, so they're just gonna kind of be really slow. Um, and then, so when do I start in the spring? Um, obviously with snow and the variability of spring, it can really vary. So it's in, in the spring, um, that's a time I'm like obsessively checking the weather most of all, I think. Um, you're going to maybe, if you're transplanting, have to have a little bit of a plan on uh, maybe fertilizing a seedling if it can't, if there's a later snow than you expect. Um, but in general, I'm planting frost tolerant plants. So basically almost any green you can think of, except maybe something like a heading cabbage, uh, something like that is going to be a, a frost tolerant plant. Beets, carrots, onions. Um, green onions um, are all things that I start out really early. Um, and we're going to talk more about row cover, but I, if it, if I can get out there early in the season, I will start April 1st, to, but I will definitely plan on using row cover because it, it'll keep the snow out, but it'll also just protect those plants from some wind and kind of provide a little microclimate. You, if you're not, uh, if you don't have row cover, I would just say just four weeks is a good rule of thumb um, because you have to be flexible, right? Like you might, you might lose that first planting of kale if you get a big snowstorm, if you plant something April 15th and you get April 20th, you get a, uh, well, maybe April 20th, you would look at the 10 day forecast, but you get a really late snowstorm April 30th, you weren't expecting. Sometimes those plants come through, but sometimes they don't. So it's really important. I plant a lot of successions in the spring. I, I plant a lot of successions in general, but uh, plants are going to react differently at different stages of growth. So for like example, I might grow, I might do three plantings of cauliflower a week apart um, because I found that cauliflower, when it's starting to go into that more of getting close to its budding stage, if it gets cold, it gets real, those, those, that crown is just gonna be pretty weird. Um, so if it's in that, if one of those plantings is in that stage, then it might not flourish as much, but the other two might be okay. Um, and I'll also say rain and moisture is gonna maybe hold you up as much as cold. Snow is gonna hold you up. Um, and then it's, it's just really hard as humans to be out in the field at that time to, and sometimes the plants are just, you're not gonna wanna put plants out. So you have to just be really flexible. If it's a cold, you're getting like icy rain, you might have to hold off a week. And that's what, um, and with climate change, it's all even more unpredictable. Um, all right, so, I mentioned row covers. This was, I was showing the slide to my sister who does not know uh, anything about farming basically. And uh, she thought this was the funniest row covers. Like I love them, I hate them. Um, they are great. They can kind of provide your own little microclimate. They're gonna add a few degrees of protection. They're gonna protect from wind. Sometimes wind is 
you know, a, a green, a, a, this is like some beautiful purple, some Lady Murasaki mustard greens. Those big leaves, if they're blowing in the wind, are probably going to, you know, they're just not going to be happy. Um, but if you have that row cover over it, it kind of shades it from the wind a little bit. However, I've spent so much of my life chasing row cover. It's in a tree. It blew halfway across the field. Um, yeah, <laughs> it, it can be a real pain. Um, a cheap solution that I found, I mean, I, I, I will buy like those sandbags that are, and you can fill those with rocks, you can fill those with sand, you can fill those anything heavy. And those are a little nicer, but if you um, don't want to spend the money on that, you can, for a while we used milk jugs, or if you suddenly need extra, you can use some milk jug and just fill them with water. Some of them will crack, but it is a nice cheap uh, way to hold that row cover down. And some people get really detailed with row cover and there's a really good research of, with people using, oh, if I'd use a 19 weight versus a 30 weight or there's even higher weights um, that provide more protection. Um, or if I use a double layer or a single layer, um, there's a lot of people doing really great research on this and observing that. I don't pay that close attention <laughs> to it. I just find it usually helps. Uh, sometimes I'll throw on a double layer um, because it, I have a ripped, you know, it's ripped. The ripped ones are gonna blow away more easily, but it, I'll throw a ripped one on, maybe add a little more protection. Um, the great thing about row cover is that it does provide pest protection, it's, um, especially in the spring. Those cucumber beetles, those flea beetles, uh, cabbage worms, they're, they're not getting into, they can help you so that those pests are not getting at your plants. There's a certain point where the plants are getting big enough that you're just gonna have to uncover them, but, uh, or come up with more creative boots than I have. Um, but another thing to think about in the winter is can you get this row cover off? You might have a really great crop under the row cover. If it's frozen to the ground, you're just going to rip it and you're going to be really annoyed that you did. So you're going to have to think about at a certain point, you're, you're done because you're not getting that row cover off. Um, you know, it can, if you get a snowstorm, these are going to, you know, the crop a lot of times will be fine underneath the snow, but you're it's just gonna be too hard to get at it. Um, so going back to spring, um, we do have um, two unheated hoop houses on our farm. They're 12 by 50. Um, I chose this picture in part because I wanted to highlight some things that were going wrong um, and how you can adapt. But um, these are great unheated structures. And um, what we really use them for on our farm in the spring is to get a jump on hot weather crops. So we plant tomatoes, peppers, carrots, basil, and ginger, which I think is almost impossible to grow. I've seen some people do it outside in our region, but it really will flourish in a hoop house. Um, but um, this hoop house, you can kind of see, um, so last year we kind of had a little bit of a de uh, disaster in the spring where one of our panels in our seedling house blew out in a windstorm. And luckily it was only one panel, but it did mean that a bunch of our early seedlings that we were gonna plant in here um, died. Um, and so we kind of got a little off. So in the middle row um, and on the right-hand row of that photo, our peppers, they're not looking as normally healthy as I would like. And normally we'd plant them April 25th in this hoop house, um, which would be about a month before we're gonna plant them outside. But um, this year we had planted them May 21st. This photo was taken in early June. Um, and you kind of see balled up in the back, um, there's a, some row cover. Um, so the nice thing about hoop houses is you can also put on row cover and add another layer of protection. So you're thinking, oh, the passive heat and protection of this hoop house is gonna protect things, but also um, you can add that in with the row cover. Um, but um, 
you can also see in this photo, this is the worst soil on the farm. So that's another reason some of these plants are not looking that happy. And so one of the things to think about if you're constantly planting, like if you have a uh, unheated structure and you're constantly planting on it, in it, um, we're actually taking, we have some stuff planted, some greens planted in there now, but in March when we pull those, I'm gonna plant a cover crop and rest this house um, because it's gotten so used in the 11 years that it's been there. <laughs> um, but um, the other things we have planted in here, we have a good sample of interplanting. We put celery on either side of that middle peppers and we transplanted that. It says May 2nd, but I think we maybe transplanted it May 21st. Um, and we harvested that in August. Um, and then on the left, you can see carrots. Um, and carrots, this is a great example of um, days to maturity being affected by um, the, by sunlight, right? So we har we direct to do these February 12th as soon as we we're out of that Persephone period. Um, in the middle of the summer, we might have harvested those um, mid-May, but we didn't start harvesting them until June. Also, they have smaller tops, which I then I normally would like. We har started harvesting them right around when this photo was taken, but um, I think part of the is the soil quality, but I think another part of it is um, the day length. All right, winter hoop houses. Um, we're using this to plant a lot of greens, kale, spinach. Um, in this photo, which is taken, so, let's see, yeah, September 22nd, so right around we're going into fall. Um, you can see we interplanted some lettuce and the lettuce heads. And then this is what's called fun gen, which is one of, um, I like to grow because I joke that I am fun gen. Most of my coworkers think this is not as hilarious as I do, um, but it's a non-heading Chinese cabbage. I love it. Um, I'm gonna talk about it a little more, but um, it's a great example of something people think it's lettuce, uh, but it, because it's so mild, but it is actually a Chinese cabbage. Um, in the winter, I think of the hoop house as the ultimate refrigerator. So like I talked about that Persephone period, I'm not gonna plant, harvest anything from the um, hoop house. I wanna have it ready to harvest in that kind of going into November at the size that I want it to be, right? But um, I'm probably not gonna um, harvest from there until I've gotten everything from outside, but, I can. So we'll, we have kale outside. We also have kale in the hoop house. And I'm going to try not to touch that until I can't get at the outside kale. Obviously, sometimes, you know, in November, you might have outside kale and it's just pouring rain and you need to harvest something. And then you still have that there, your refrigerator. Um, and like I said, it's going to bolt in the spring. But we're planting, our earliest planting in here is July. So um, that's going to mean you're going to have to balance planting some of those hot weather crops. You might not be able to have a late season tomato planting if you want to get, I think that July we were planting some chicories and ribby kale, but the latest planting is October 1st, which was spinach. Um, and so I'm going to pause for a minute to see if people have questions and so that I'm not talking just at you. Um, just to let you know, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is to get into specific um, varieties and specific types of plants. So if you have a question about kale and like what varieties I grow, when do I plant it? I'm gonna get into that next. So, but if you have a question about row cover or um, basically anything I've talked about, now, now is the time, or you can just hold off and um, uh, this is like two thirds of the way through my presentation. So I'm gonna really try to leave time for more questions at the end. As of right now, there are no questions in the chat, Jen, okay. but okay. anyone feel free. Let's give folks a moment to um, yeah. to use the chat or unmute yourself and uh, ask your question if you would like. Yeah, I took, I included this photo. This is that fun gen after it flowered in March and then I just picked it and put it on my um, kitchen table. Um, but also you can see sometimes I'll leave those just for pollinators early on in the season, which is another nice thing if you can 
Um, you don't need to use that growing space. It's beautiful and um, productive in a different way than harvesting would be. Okay, um, Susanna asked, uh, did you say you also plant carrots outside the hoop house in early spring or only in the hoop house? Yeah, so uh, with carrots, um, and I'm not gonna talk about specifically about carrots, so I can do it right now. Um, carrots, I will start planting like in the hoop house. I planted that um, in February and those will be ready in, like I said, June. And then I'll start planting outside in as early April as you know I can. Um, if it's really muddy, direct seeding carrots is just like a disaster. Um, and then I keep planting them outside um, until um, early August. Once you're getting into August, you're really getting that um, that fall factor with carrots, um, and you really want to use uh, plant Bolero and Napoli are the two varieties they um, that I plant. Um, for that later season because they're gonna, their dates to maturity is 60 days um, versus um, some of the other carrots that I grow in the main season, like I might plant in April are um, like a Scarlet Nantes or a Deep Purple. Um, those often will have a little bit like more of a 75 day date of maturity. Um, so I'm planting carrots kind of throughout the season the carrots that I, I usually don't grow carrots in the hoop house in the winter. You certainly can um, because a lot of those late season carrots that I plant in um, late July and August, I will then harvest them um, in October, November and put them in our walk-in cooler or if you have a root cellar. Um, and so I'm selling and eating carrots um, throughout the winter, but I don't need to have them in that hoop house during that time. Um, and those outdoor carrots are like the best thing. They get so sweet. And the other thing you can do, um, is you can, um, I have, I mentioned the caterpillar tunnel and I didn't talk about it. The caterpillar tunnel that I have, it's just made of PVC pipe and rebar and it can't hold, it hold snow. Like it, it is not, it's kind of a pain, but I only built it for a couple hundred bucks. And so sometimes what I will do with that is I, it's easy to move as opposed to the hoop house. Um, and so I can move that over some carrots and I'm like, if I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna get to harvest these until um, we're gonna get a snowstorm, and I wanna still be able to harvest these, I can get into those that. Um, or you can just mulch carrots and then pull the mulch off sometimes with like, hey, your leaves, leaves are great that time you, and still get at them, yeah. Okay. And uh, Wendy Nicole asks about rotating crops in your hoop houses and pest management practices for brassicas in the hoop house. Oh, those are like two of my biggest challenges. <laughs> um, so I, uh, yeah, in my fields, I have like much better, like, uh rotation in the hoop house it's really challenging um one of the things i've done is i plant brassicas in one one year and in the other one the next year i don't know how much it's necessarily doing for pests and because they're right next to each other but at least it's not taking some of the same nutrients from the soil um I grow so many brassicas and it's one of my biggest struggles is how much space it takes up and trying to find other things that could fill that niche. So I'm not kind of using, it's taking up too much of the crop rotation, especially in hoop houses. Um, but usually what I'll do is I'll have one hoop house that might have like spinach and um, lettuce and carrots in it, for example. And the other one will have like the kale and the mustard greens. Um, and for pests, um, I definitely get some overwintering, I think, of pests, especially when we don't have a cold winter, and that's definitely something to consider. And so one of the things I do is that's when the row covers it come in handy. So I'm not, you know, they're not escaping my brassica hoop house to go to my early kale planting. Um, and that 
but I also, you know, for example, I won't plant um, like uh, mustard mix for a salad mix in the spring because I just want to not, I'm not trying to get those early, that kind of early breath goes in. Um, but I do get a lot of aphids. They're annoying. I find that when plants in the soil are healthier, there's less of a problem, but they're still there. That's definitely the biggest pest I have in my poop house during the winter. Yeah. And I'm still trying to figure out the best strategy for them. <laughs> uh, one, one question for me, Jen, and um, I appreciate your, your love-hate relationship with the uh, uh, floating row covers. Um, <laughs> is storage. How do you, what do you do with your row covers when you're not, when they're not in the field? Yes. Ideally we have a little, uh, like, uh, kind of winder upper thing. That's you've come up with a better name of it. Um, where I can kind of, I have a, just, a, I think it's literally like a tube that came from some other role of something that I had. And I have it kind of mounted on this like saw horse with the, um, just a, uh, pole and you can roll those up and um, so that's what I ideally do sometimes if I'm like oh my goodness I like this uh, fall because it was so nice so late and then all of a sudden I was like there's still all this row cover and we have to pick it up some of it is just kind of in a pile on some bags in my barn uh, which is not great sometimes mice or other creatures try to make homes in there. So that's definitely something to think about. Um, and also labeling is super important. Um, so the, the stuff that is, I'd say about half of our row cover is very well stored right now. And it's in sealed bags or um, just bins, like uh, Rubbermaid bin. Um, and we actually labeled it. Um, we have some beds that are hundred feet and some beds that are 75 feet. And so they're labeled with that and then they're also labeled I kind of do three grades of like this is still perfect and would be great for if I need it um to keep out pests and then I have a grade of like it's torn but it's going to be good for you know that that um temperature and then I have a grade that's like it's pretty torn but I, I will use it for um helping to keep moisture in for germinating direct seeded crops especially carrots um but other people who are more organized than me have great, much better systems. I've seen a lot of people hang them. So it's less likely that something is gonna create a nest in it. Um, and I, yeah, I've seen people do like these, they twist it and tie it in this really nice way. Um, almost like they're like braiding it. But there's a lot of, I feel like there's, everyone has a, a system that they like. I don't necessarily like my system, but it's working. <laughs> the uh, the the mouse nesting is, uh, I, I you know the, they they just seem to love making nests in there. And oh, you, they really they do. Chew yeah, for those... it and the holes and yes, yes, <laughs> it's a challenge. Really... All right, uh, how about one more question and then and then we'll move on. Um, yeah. Joe Leghorn, if you grow in raised beds, hmm. would load tunnels work just like a hoop house for carrots in early plantings? Yes, yeah, so that is definitely something that I have thought about and would like to do. It just happens that when I started working at this farm, we had those hoop houses. Um, but I've definitely, I definitely think low tunnels would work really great. And um, I have kind of experimented with making some low tunnels with, um, you know, if I've had to replace that hoop house plastic a couple times. And old greenhouse hoop house plastic is great for kind of a quick low tunnel, um, I would say, as long as it doesn't have too many holes. Yeah, Great. so I can kind of keep going here um, and get into some specifics. I just had, tried to highlight a couple different things. I'm gonna talk both about just a few crops in general and then kind of get into some, a little bit with variety selection on some of these. Um, these are three different types of kale. Actually, the middle one we stopped growing, even though I liked it. Uh, people that I was giving it to didn't like it as much, so I stopped. But um, so kale, um, 
So one of the things I think when you're thinking of season extension is thinking of different uses for something. So with kale, um, for my winter CSA, I do it differently than I, my summer CSA. I give people choice in the summer, they just get whatever. And so I will often offer them bunching kale or baby kale, or sometimes I'll be like, it's medium sized kale, right? Um, and so this is a good example. This is some kale that I was harvesting. I think I can play this video. It was snowing, it was early December. Um, this was kale that I had planted either really early in April or at least or mid season. Um, but it, um, and it's smaller than you, I normally would want for bunching kale. Um, and it's a little bit too big to put as a baby kale, but I had already harvested probably all of the bigger leaves. And then I was moving on to getting these last, these smaller leaves. And then the last kind of smallest leaves I might harvest as baby kale or to throw in a salad mix. So you kind of get, can think of like, oh, I can get different things out of this. Um, and so for kale, I'm transplanting kale. Um, this last year we did April 10th, June 1st and August 15th. And you can really, anywhere in that range, you could be planting it. Um, and re really the June 1st one, that's for, it's, I often find that, you know, that first planting, I'll be harvesting it until like the um, winter, but it starts to get a little tired. Um, I, I think kale doesn't necessarily love to grow in the heat of the summer either. Um, and so planting that June 1st gives me kind of, um, helps me kind of give that early planting a break. Um, it also plants that I find that are growing and maturing kind of into the fall will often, I think, be more resilient than plants that started growing in the, the cool season and then were kind of adapted to hot weather. Um, as a general rule, I often find that um, that's the case. Um, and so, yeah, we harvest kale um, out, from outside, play the video again, but our outside June 1st through December. And I could definitely be doing that a little bit earlier. Um, I tend not to um, focus for, try, push for a lot of harvests in May just because we're so busy with planting, but I'm not trying to harvest things. Then I might harvest some kale for myself or for our lunches. Um, and then I harvest from the hoop house December through March. Um, and that, and then in March, that's when that kale will start bolting. Um, I would say kale, there's so many wonderful varieties of kale. Um, these are the four ones that we grow currently. Um, the one in the picture is a dwarf scotch one. And we kind of grow that all season. I, I think it's the best uh, kind of like all season kale. Um, and then the Russian frill that we grow, that one is really beautiful. And I, we don't grow that in the hoop house. We grow that just outside. Um, and then the dazzling blue is one that I just started to grow. It's kind of a lacinato type. And the thing that I'm gonna try to do with that is I actually got a um, breeder's mix that someone has been breeding for um, overwintering and not flowering quickly. So I planted outside and we're gonna see if I can get some of, even though I just said, I'm trying not to harvest things in April or May, I still, um, I'm curious if I can get that to overwinter. Um, and that was something that someone is selecting for. So you can re really find people who are doing this breeding work um, for those kind of specific needs. Um, I think that when I got from the experimental farm network, they have a lot of great um, projects. And then um, the Western front kale, I grow in hoop houses. And the great thing about that one is it is one of those examples of low light regrowth. That one will be in the hoop house. I'll have harvested from it. It'll look terrible. Um, and then it'll start growing again. It's just, it's a real survivor of a kale. Um, and so I really love that one. And I, yeah. I, um, and then spinach, spinach, uh, man, spinach. I basically harvest all, practically all year round except the heat of the summer. 
Um, so I kind of do two different successions um, or two kind of main plantings, a spring planting and a fall planting. So I transplant and direct seed spinach. Um, so we did April 1st, April 15th and April 25th. That's a good example of um, spreading that out in case of weather, um, but also it's just helpful. So it's not all maturing at the same time. <laughs> um, and then I'll plant again, August 10th, August 17th and October 1st. Um, and the October 1st one will, is the hoop is, I think the hoop house and I will plant some outside to try to overwinter. It's one of the only things I really try to overwinter. Um, and, the, and I think overwintering spinach is great. Um, it's so hardy. It can get no row cover, totally snowed on and then go back somehow in the uh, spring fine. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, so the October 1st spinach that I plant outside, it um, it's usually going to be a little smaller because a really big plant, if you think of it, it's just going to have a harder time maybe going through that unprotected outdoor area. Um, and um, so you don't want to plant or have really big plants that you're trying to overwinter. Um, and then um, the October 1st planting that I'm planting in the hoop house, that is gonna, like, a, it's it's gonna be, you know, it'll be a little bit sizable in um, going into November, December, but that is more replacing some of the earlier planting, like the October 10th, the October 17th that I might plant in a hoop house um, or outside. Um, that is what I'm gonna harvest early on. Um, so that's a good example of thinking about days to maturity. Um, you're not going to harvest something you're planting that late in the season until the, basically the next or late winter or early spring, usually. Um, and also planting things, you'll notice I planted the fall spinach a lot closer together in succession between the October 10th and the October 17th than in the, or August, than in the April, because as you're getting less light, so that week, a week in August is going to be uh, a lot bigger difference when you come to harvesting um, because of that lack of light. Um, and there's a lot of great resources. Um, I think Elliot Coleman and I think it's the Winter Harvest Handbook has charts of like, if you plant something August 10th, you're gonna harvest it this date. But if you do it August 17th, it is gonna be this much later. And that's a really helpful guide to look at. Um, in terms of variety, I have tried every variety. I feel like in the spring, I have no preference for spring spinach, but I do have strong preference for two winter spinaches, um, giant winter and winter bloom fail. Um, the one in my, that is the size of my hand, which I had people be like, did you really grow this? Like people get freaked out. So I think sometimes when things are really big, they think it means it's been like genetically modified. I think sometimes people, have, yeah, have this weird idea. It can't possibly look, be that great. Um, their own internal biases um, about kind of organic. Um, but I think I harvested this in February. So that was from the hoop house in February, nice and big, absolutely delicious. Um, and so another example um, of kind of when you're thinking of crops as, um, uh, as using different types within a family for different uses. So I grow kind of two overall types of turnips, storage and things to grow more for fresh. So the uh, purple globe cop turnip. Um, that's what I'm really growing for uh, storage. So I direct seed it two successions in July 15th, July 25th, and I can harvest that from September 15th through October 15th. And um, then I put that in my walk-in cooler. If you have a root cellar, that's a great option. And that will keep for months. Um, and so that's a great 
I love turnips. Um, and the, the other kind of main type I grow is uh, what's called hakurai. It's a type of Japanese salad turnip. I love hakurai turnips. They, you don't have to cook them. They're smaller. You can see in this picture, they're, that's kind of like their full size. It's more closer to a radish size. Um, and I, heart, I transplanted them this year. You can also direct seed them, but the seed is really expensive. So I try to transplant them to kind of conserve the seed as much as possible and kind of baby them. But May 1st, May 21st, June 27th, August 6th, and September 27th. You could kind of plant that anytime. I kind of have that gap in the middle because I plant less of them when all these other things are coming in, you know, need less turnips when people are excited to be eating summer squash and zucchini and peppers. Um, but this is one of those examples of a crop that like on paper, I think it's supposed to be good until even I think down to like maybe the high twenties. Um, but I have like found it to be amazingly resilient. Um, and it's really interesting to experiment. These, I, this picture was taken, um, November 26th, so it has that layer of row cover, but, and this wasn't this year, this was two years ago. So it was a colder fall than it was this year. Um, and they're just still great. I mean, the tops you can see have a little bit of damage on them. They're not going to be as pretty, um, but they're still delicious. And so that means I might give these turnips to people at part of the CSA and hold on to those storage turnips until I don't have access to these turnips. Um, yeah. Chinese cabbage is another one that I think um, you can think of in terms of fresh versus storage. Um, and uh, the varieties I grow, I grow Minuet Merlot, which is this really nice um, purple Chinese cabbage. It makes the coolest color kimchi, um, especially if you use like purple carrots and uh, some purple mustard greens and can look really cool. Um, and winter crisp. Um, so I do two plantings. This is, I transplant um, April 20th to harvest June 10th through July. Chinese cabbage is one of those things that I find it heading up can kind of be dependent on the season, it, like what, how mild or not mild the spring is. Um, but it's a great kind of big, early, kind of hefty green to give people at a time when you're giving them spinach and lettuce and their boxes for the CSA feel really light. Um, and then I do a second planting for fall in um, August 1st. Um, and I start harvesting that uh, October 1st um, through mid-November. So I show this photo, this is the winter crisp um, variety. It gets really large. Um, and this is a good example of, I kind of left this in the field while I was doing a lot of other things. Um, this is early November. I could have harvested it probably in October. Um, I don't think it put on a ton of growth throughout October, but I was just busy dealing with other stuff. And I think I had, I harvested some of it, but I left some to see what it would do. Um, and so you can see this definitely from the cold weather got some damage on the top. You can kind of see it's brown. And but this is a this cabbage was larger than my head. So I just peeled off those layers and you can't tell. And when I pulled that out of the field, I also then stuck it into the walk-in cooler um, and that kept kind of through December. Um, so it's a great way to kind of extend uh, something that you don't necessarily think of as a storage crop. Um, and that's another thing where you can look at varieties uh, for cabbages or things like that that will tell you these are better storage ones than spring varieties. Yeah. Um, and then I want to put a plug in for the kind of what's called a non-heading Chinese cabbage, um, one of the more unusual things I grow. So like Fungen, Tokyo Bacana, these are varieties. And um, it almost looks like a really um, non-headed, like kind of really open lettuce head. It tastes really mild. I throw it in my salad mixes. And um, unless I, you know, I will mention that it is a brassica because I do have one person in my CSA who is allergic to brassicas unless they're cooked but otherwise I don't think most people would ever know the difference from lettuce um, so it's a great um, kind of way to get something that maybe people um, might not necessarily think of um, and I can um, that one is another great you can kind of uh, 
cut and come again and it'll regrow it'll also and it grows very fast so i transplant september 15th and october 15th um, outside and in the um uh hoop house and the september 15th that i i think i i harvested that once in october um for our csa and it regrew by november to just it's just chilling out there right now i've been slowly harvesting it um yeah so um but i think that makes me think of one of the things you're thinking of when you're thinking of your refrigerator is if you know whatever you have in your hoop house november 7th if you want to have you know five bunches of kale or would say let's do simpler math since doing quick math so you want a bunch of kale a week so you're only growing you know maybe for yourself um that means if there's a three-month period that you're harvesting from that hoop house you're all, you're gonna want basically enough for 12 bunches of kale already ready november 7th so you're gonna scale that up if you want to be able to offer a csa to 20 people you're gonna have to think of that um and then i would say you also can just be flex flexible when you're trying to sell to people um uh, people love you if you bring them fresh greens in the winter they act like it is like they just and they will eat things that they would never eat in july i will give people all sorts of things that they're like what is this i give them a recipe and then they're like this is my new favorite thing um so i wanted to like leave on some resources um Pam Dolling, she has some a couple of books, but she also has a really great um, website, Sustainable Market Farming, um, and my she, a lot of great resources. She's in Virginia, but on um, what uh, different winter growing. But my favorite thing is she has what's called her winter kill uh, temperature list, and she updates that every year from her observation. So she'll you'll scroll through it, and it'll say you know, at 32, you know, your, ba your, your basil and your peppers are dead, right? But at 28, um, this type of Chinese cabbage might die, but another one might, I've seen make it down to 20. And she goes down to 15 to show, or just overwintering some things like, you know, scallions, wheat, spinach. And so that's a really, and great, great resource. Um, uh, Growing for Market Magazine, I subscribe to, and they have a lot of great um, resources. Um, the Frozen Ground Conference is a conference that I think happens every other year, and I've, I've actually never been to it, but they post their notes. Um, if you just Google that, Frozen Ground Conference, Vermont, I think, um, that is just that when I talked about, like, people will get into I use double row cover. I use this weight of row. They get into really great, um, to just kind of conversations about their best practices, um, which also I put Instagram and other social media. I'm very much someone who resisted getting a smartphone for a ridiculously long time. And then I went to a farm conference and people were like, I learned so much from Instagram. And so I know everyone has their like own um, complicated relationship with social media, but following other farms that are doing winter growing or doing spring growing are just, um, you can also find people if you're less of a market grower, but maybe doing some more homesteading. There are so many people who are sharing information out there on Instagram. Um, it's really great. Um, and then uh, podcasts, um, the winter grower podcast, I really love. It gets into a lot of these kind of details. Um, and different farmers. Um, I also, the Farmer to Farmer podcast, um, the man that hosted it passed away, but there's a great archive of his podcasting that is not just um, season extension, it's all different topics and just a great resource for when you're weeding and you need a distraction. Um, Elliot Coleman's books um, have a lot of great charts. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I will have this shared so you can um, kind of see this. And like I said, I'll put, I can um, put my um, 
contact information in the chat too if anyone wants to email me with questions or um, you can find me. Um, I post a lot on Instagram, I, on the Dismas Family website or on my own personal um, Instagram, which is like uh, our own strings. So O-U-R-O-W-N strings. But yeah, we'll open it up. We don't have a lot of time, but can open up to some more questions. Thank you, Jen. Um, please, please put your questions in the chat or again, uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question in person. Uh, Jen, I just wanted to say um, uh, thank you for the, the variety recommendations. Oh, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to finding the fun, Jen. And, oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think Benco definitely cares. It. Yeah. That's great. And um, you know, thank you for your work in combining uh, social justice in, in agriculture. I think it's, um, you know, and uh, Dismas is a, an inspiring place and, and doing great work. So thanks for thank your, your you. leadership. Thank you. All right. Um, I see Christine's hand. I don't know if you can unmute yourself or if that's, okay, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, ask your question. Um. I'm Christine. I'm in recovery. Uh, and I actually recognize some of the uh, residents in the PowerPoint. Nice. Uh, I used to work as an addiction counselor. Mm -hmm. um, but I also found out through my recovery that I am autistic. Mm -hmm. And I noticed there are a number of animals, dogs, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the images you shared with us today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, if the animals help the residents, if they help uh, just bring up morale and, and mm -hmm. if people comment on that as they experience Dismas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I first started working at Dismas, the animals were intended to be a little bit more of a money making venture. Um, and I think, you know, it's hard to focus on a lot of different enterprises. Um, and so, and we were, you know, we were selling meat and we, we sell eggs now from our chickens, but we kind of moved away from that. And yeah, the animals are much more there for, um, just for us and for our visitors. Um, so I think, yeah, they absolutely both, uh, our dogs and our cats, um, are, you know, they're very much comfort to everyone there and uh, an amusement to everyone there and uh and also I think caring for anything I think can be really empowering um especially for people who maybe weren't cared for or maybe weren't able to care for other people in their lives which I think is often an experience for people who are um in recovery um so people being able to care for those animals is I think really healing yeah um so yeah we have sheep we have mini goats and we have mini horses we started just getting mini animals because people love them people lo like people love to come and see our, them and you know they they help kind of keep some of the weeds down in our pasture and things like that but really yes they're there because we really just love them yeah Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, Wendy asks about, do you have any experience with thickness of plastic and uh, for oh. hoop houses? You know, do yeah. you think that a, a thicker plastic is gonna provide more insulation or warmth uh, or affect, <laughs> affect the light? Yes. <laughs> um, I think what we have is six millimeter plastic on our hoop houses and um, it's been a while since we, it's almost time for us to replace it again but um that definitely has an impact um it's definitely one of those places where because i am trying to kind of uh reduce costs sometimes it's like i think there's some really neat different types of plastics you can put on hoop houses now there's that one now that's like it's called solar wrap it has like bubbles you can do the double layer and inflate it. Um, 
but for us it's just the what we have it's just a very standard greenhouse plastic it's easy to get um and uh also one of the things i found is we break a lot of things on our farm <laughs> you know we have people who this isn't what they do all the time uh and even if you're you know you know been doing it for a long time sometimes you know i've gone to knock snow off a hoop house and i cut you know accidentally ripped the plastic so knowing that you know we might not oh i i haven't really invested in some of the higher end plastics but i think there's some really nice stuff out there and especially um some of it has to be replaced less which i think is also good from an environmental standpoint yeah great and Anne says they use uh solar wrap on their greenhouse yeah. and it's amazing uh, yeah it looks very nice <laughs> um let's see susanna asked about netting does netting offer any protection against cold that's worthwhile mm -hmm. so yeah we do use what's called protect net netting um but from what i understand it doesn't offer um any protection although you know like i said with wind it might keep a little bit of the wind off we use that primarily in the middle of the summer when I don't want to be adding a lot of heat, especially to something like a brassica or a lettuce that's um, going to be stressed out by that. But I want to keep out, like, especially those brassica pests we talked about. So yeah, I buy that um, protect net and I use that kind of in that, in the hotter weather for, especially for fall transplants. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, Phoebe had a question clarifying in, I, uh, do you focus on cool weather greens exclusively or do you grow warm weather crops as well? Oh yeah. So yeah, we grow warm weather stuff. Um, that was not the focus, but, um, yeah, we grow, you know, we have kind of a traditional, um, CSA that runs through the summer. We have our farm stand in the summer. So that is like one of the challenges is like, balancing kind of uh two acres can seem like a lot but you can sometimes it can be tricky it's like oh i should pull these tomato plants so i can plant my fall spinach but i don't want to say goodbye to the tomatoes yet um and that always is like so tricky but yeah we grow um a, a bunch you know it's where i think it's like 40 different types of vegetables and you know herbs some herbs and flowers and so we definitely yeah we're growing all year but yeah spread i it's nice to not have as much of uh the workload in you know the stuff that we harvest in july and august uh that pressure it can be a little tricky to be in the height of like harvesting all of your tomatoes and then also being like i have to get out there and plant this fall kale like it definitely can be a balance i was saying to someone right now when i'm planning i have all these great ideas but i do have to remember like what it feels like in august there's always a week in august where i'm like why did i ever choose this as a job <laughs> And then it's fine. Like you get to, it's like the week it's 95 and you're still you're harvesting and you're trying to plant and then it cools off and it's yeah, it's fine again. But yeah, yeah. So we do grow all your kind of traditional summer crops too. Yeah. Anyone else out there have a, a question? We have a, a few minutes left. <laughs> So I'll put um, my contact information in the chat too. So great. Um, and the slides will be in, there's a, I think a folder for um, anyone who wants to um, just kind of 
looked over these slides, especially the resource slide, I think. Um, yeah, but this was great. Um, yeah, thanks so much everyone for coming. And yeah, this was, what a, I'm so glad I'm excited to go to other um, workshops today. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks again, Jen, for the, the inspiration. And, you know, I, 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 I kind of hear your point about, you know, the, the benefits of season extension and this sorts, you know, you can get to the end of the end of the fall and think, oh, it's, um, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm ready to just, you know, clean things up and be done. But it's, um, there's a lot of opportunity that can, you know, find that that initial that another round of motivation to, to uh, keep things in the ground throughout the mm -hmm. throughout the winter. So Thank you for that and uh, very appropriate um, uh, today. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I also put the evaluate uh, a quick evaluation link in the chat. So please provide feedback um, about this session as well as the other sessions you'll attend uh, over the weekend. And thanks again, everyone, for coming out to uh, our, our virtual winter conference. Yeah. And you know, maybe this maybe this summer is the summer that we get back in person. Um, so let's let's keep our fingers crossed and and um, take care out there. Thanks everybody.